A cornerstone of Joe Biden's 2020 campaign was his promise to reform the criminal justice system. The then-candidate promised, among other things, the end of private prisons, no more mandatory minimums, decriminalizing marijuana, expunging records for related convictions, in great part because of their impact on poor people and people of color. And at first, things seemed promising. Biden's first week in office included an executive order scaling back the use of private prisons. A few months later, his Justice Department suspended federal executions. But since then, there hasn't been much more. And a year into his term, many are frustrated. In December, several activist groups wrote a letter to Biden's Justice Department criticizing what they said has been a, quote, doubling down on the failed policies of the past administration instead of charting a bold new course. But as my next guest has found out over the course of our career, the justice system's injustices run deep. Laura Coates is a former federal prosecutor serving as assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, trial attorney in the DOJ Civil Rights Division. She, of course, is now a CNN senior legal analyst and the author of a great book, Just Pursuit, a Black Prosecutor's Fight for Fairness. Laura, it's great to meet you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. I'm glad to be. Thank you. So for people who like to ease into their reading, this is not the book for them. It's only a few pages in when you talk about your supervisor approaching you right after you've won a case and he utters four words, we got another one. What did he mean by those four words? Well, you know, I'd like to extend a benefit of the doubt and think maybe he meant just a conviction, but there was something about it that really felt like an indoctrination. And the reality was that over a long course of the career, it was really about the us versus thems. And that is always very problematic to think about when you're a public servant. And when you say you're on behalf of the people of the United States, that includes the defendants oftentimes. As, as odd as that might seem to people as a prosecutor, you must ensure that their rights are also preserved and protected. And so hearing that just was sort of the, the one of the final straws that broke this particular camel's back and the notion of thinking, how these battles of allegiances we often all have of having one's lived experience, every facet of your identity, often be in extraordinary tension with the directives of the office and the demands of the justice system. You know, your book is a series of uh, examples of racism infecting virtually every crack and crevice of the justice system. I don't think people will be surprised so much about racism directed at defendants because of the color of their skin. They might be surprised at racism directed at lawyers because of the color of their skin. You experienced it. Were you surprised? You know, I have to tell you, it was very startling for me to go from the Civil Rights Division in particular, where it's almost a foregone conclusion whose champion you are. The idea of thinking about trying to preserve the rights and protect the rights mm -hmm. of those who have been marginalized, those who've had their rights infringed, particularly in the voting rights context. And then even under that same umbrella of the justice system, becoming a criminal prosecutor, really for many felt as though I had betrayed that same community, even though the victims were overwhelmingly black and brown. The idea that I was standing in a place as a black woman where the stereotypical man, the white man would actually be, the perception was that there was no opportunity to really be on the one hand, a civil rights proponent and also a prosecutor. Those two things could not actually meet up, they believed. And especially as a black woman, that was often challenged as to whose side I was really on. And of course, we all know that this system that we have is really a legal system aspiring to be a justice system, much like this country is still aspiring to be what it says it is on paper. But the idea of having this fallacy that black and brown people must occupy but one role in a criminal courtroom, that a defendant or perhaps defense counsel, I think needs to be disrupted. And frankly, those who are proponents of civil rights should be everywhere where power can be wielded and discretion exercised. You know, to follow up on your thoughts, to make the criminal justice system into a real justice system, it seems mm -hmm. at least so far as I mentioned, Congress doesn't appear ready to do it. Most state legislatures surely don't. It seems to me that the next stage of reform is really on the ground level. Here in Boston until a month ago when she was promoted to be the U.S. attorney in the first roll call vote on a U.S. attorney, I think in decades, Rachel Rollins was a Suffolk County DA, and she, in her campaign, talked about 15 low-level crimes that where the rebuttable presumption was she would not prosecute them. There are a number of progressive district attorneys on the county level around the country. That is where the next layer of reform, if it's to come, is going to come from, isn't it? 
You know, it is, I think, in many respects, but I want to be cautious. Of course, you know, I was not a prosecutor who worked at, under an elected official. I was certainly at political sure. appointees as U.S. attorneys. And there is a different calculus involved for those who are campaigning and those who, of course, are beholden to the electorate. But the premise is really the same and that, you know, the idea that prosecutors and the government is expected to be perfect and no time to do so or have resources that are limited shows you that sometimes prosecutors are prioritizing cases that the average person who might be a victim or might be a citizen in the country or somebody who's watching this might take issue with. How could you not pursue this crime? It's a crime. A crime is a crime is a crime in a nation of laws. And I think it really is prudent for prosecutors to start to really be open about the fact that even when they're not elected, we make judgment calls day in and day out about the cases we're going to prosecute and the ones we're not going to. And that cost benefit analysis might really surprise people, but with limited resources, with the idea of the priority set and handed down oftentimes from the AG on down, mm -hmm. these decisions can oftentimes be disruptive and really disturbing, but nonetheless necessary. Well, prosecutorial discretion, a term that I think the, the average person on the street has no conception of, but it's there. <laughs> Speaking of discretion though, in a incredibly moving part of your book, you felt you had no discretion as a uh, lawyer when a uh, crime victim uh, came to your attention, was illegally in the country, you became aware of the fact that ICE, or at least some immigration authorities, were gonna come arrest and deport him. Uh, you didn't warn him. How, how hard was that, and why did you make the choice you did? I mean, it's excruciating of a choice, but it's also excruciating, of course, for the people who are faced with that proposition of either report a crime committed against them or remain in the shadows to be further exploited or victimized. I mean, imagine if it was a sexual assault victim. In this case, it was a victim of a car theft, yeah. but imagine an even more serious crime. And we as a society want people to come forward and say what has happened and having that difficult, if not impossible choice of either say and be deported or be quiet and be victimized. And for me, the protocol in the office required me to have to alert the authorities, essentially treat this person who'd been in the country for decades, had not so much as sneezed in yeah. the direction of a police officer since arriving in this country and remaining illegally, but was equated with those who were criminals for which we do seek accountability for the nature of their actual crimes. And um, there is a real tension there in terms of that battle of allegiance. I can tell you, I write about it in the book throughout, that my moral compass sometimes pointed one direction, but the directives pointed another. And that's why I often say, which is very counterintuitive to those who don't know the system, that sometimes the pursuit of justice can create injustice. And I'm very particular about the notion that I was a prosecutor fighting for fairness because justice can so often be elusive for instances like this. You know, uh, uh, you made that choice despite where your moral compass was. Mm -hmm. uh, you're probably not familiar with a local case here where a judge about a year ago uh, decided to help someone who was undocumented in her courthouse evade federal immigration authorities who were there to snatch him. She's been indicted for that, her case, criminally indicted. Her case is on appeal. What's your reaction to what she did? I have such a heavy sigh when I think about that because I remember those moments when I had colleagues who said, tell him to run, Coates. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have that on my conscience. Others who said, well, you could do that, but you'd be aiding and abetting and interfering with the um, proper um, authorities and you could be disbarred, and that would be the, the best case scenario to be disbarred in that circumstance. You know, others who said, look, you're a prosecutor. What do you care? The law is the law, and if the law was broken, you don't, you're, you have clean hands. No one else does in this scenario. But I tell you, it's a, it was a really heart-wrenching decision, and one um, that I think about, I'm not familiar with the case you're speaking about, but I can only imagine what that was like mm -hmm. for a judge to see unfairness in that way and make that particular decision, that great personal peril and consequence to herself. But it just goes to show you, when I write about in the book, you know, oftentimes if you find yourself looking at our system and saying, well, what else could you do? There are no other alternatives that don't have those consequences. Then therein lies the opportunities for reform because we have to be a, a country, in my opinion, that actually understands that fairness has got to be as much a part of the justice system as we profess that it is. And what an unbelievable choice she made. And I, I wonder, I wonder if she regrets it, given the great personal peril. You know, but do you? Fairness obviously has to be the goal. Are you a hopeful? 
kind of person or are you of the belief that bias and racism are so baked into the criminal justice system that the best we can do is chip away at the edges? You know, I am an eternal optimist and I'm very glass half full, not because I'm naive or have rose colored glasses, but because what is the alternative to resign ourselves to the status quo and just say, this is the way it's always going to be? I mean, the only reason you think about inertia, things tend to stay in motion until they're disrupted by some outside external force. Well, I think that we have to have optimism in a sense, in a skeptical way, but a healthy way, but optimism to really disrupt that inertia and really be able to change things. Nothing in our country has gotten done because we turned a blind eye to an issue or because it was overwhelming or because the task was really yeah. Sisyphean in so many ways. We really have to make sure that the optimism is not just pie in the sky, but actually boots on the ground to ensure that there is no longer a chasm between what ought to be right, what is, what's lawful, and what is not. I'm a cup totally empty kind of guy, so I would like a little <laughs> of you to wear off. So speaking of injustices before you go, I want to bring one more injustice up. And it all stems from this moment. Who would be a good, solid host of the show yeah. if you retired? There is an attorney. Laura Coates. She's African-American. And she appears on some of the uh, cable news shows from time to time. You may recognize that guy. It was late Alex Tr What happened? What happened? We watched Mayim Bialik and Ken Jennings. I haven't seen you hosting that show, Laura Coates. And Alex Trebek apparently wanted you. What happened? Well, man, when you see him speaking, don't you just miss him? I certainly oh, miss the, seeing his face, hearing him, hearing his questions, having that banter at the podiums for all of the different contestants. Wow, I don't think he'll ever be able to truly be replaced, nor do we really think he can be. And I got to tell you, whenever I hear and hear that, I'm so humbled because I'm a lifelong Jeopardy fan. But you know what? They didn't give me the opportunity to do so. But I, you know what? My calling is still the same. It is to ask the right questions, give the right answers, and keep my community out of jeopardy. And that's what I'll do. You are one hopeful woman. Uh, great to meet you, Laura <laughs> Coates. Congratulations on a terrific Thank book. You. I appreciate it. Thank you.